walk you through the process uh, that I go through with film viewing kind of being in the state it's in. As I'm recording this, of course, you know, the vaccines are out, more and more things are reopening, a lot of movie theaters are open. I'm not quite ready to dive back into that, but I'm hoping to do so uh, within the next couple of months. But um, where I've been watching these movies that I've been reviewing is where all of us have been watching them. You know, I've been using streaming services, which makes me feel dirty. Um, I use the Direct TV. Um, but when I watch these, I try my best to get out and review them pretty quickly after I've watched them, if I can, immediately after. Um, sometimes that's just not possible or I just don't want to. And sometimes that's that's a good thing. It gives me some time to mull some things over, gives me some time to think about things, and as such, those reviews come out a little bit more coherent than the general reviews, which are just me kind of shooting from the hip and coming at it from a first impressions kind of thing. Which, uh, I really like that format. I really like the first impressions thing. But sometimes it's also nice to have a little bit of something planned before you jump in. So a lot of times that extra day or so really pays off. And then there are times when you wake up and you say, I'm gonna review this as I'm driving here or there or whatever. And you realize, not surprisingly, that <laughs> the movie has left such a little impression on you that you're not quite sure where to start or what to say. And that is the case with this picture, Chaos Walking, which is just one of the dullest films I have watched in quite some time. So we're going to do our best to, uh, to give this film a going over and talk about the points, but I'm going to tell you, there's not a lot to go on here, folks. There's just not. It doesn't do much. Ironically, for a film that uh, keeps talking about the noise, you know, this movie's all about you can't escape the noise, it, it itself leaves no impression. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so let's, let's talk about about this little picture. So what is it? Um, well, not surprisingly, it is based on uh, a series of young adult novels, which I'm not scoffing at, but I'm going to be honest, I'm clearly not the audience for. So I'm sorry if that flavors my, my point of view a little bit. What that also means is that it's time to whip out the old YA movie Bingo card. Yes, it's YA Bingo. Are you ready? Get your card set and let's run through the YA cliches. A dystopian future. Check. A society run by an out of touch older generation. Check. A young protagonist who is an somewhat of an outcast from said society and yet whose forward thinking ways are going to make sure that he is the most specialist little snowflake that ever did exist. Check a deep dark secret that the film seems to think is a huge surprise but anybody watching it can guess within the first 10 minutes. Check. Now, I will say that this film does gain a few originality points in that the society of which our young hero resi resides is not structured to mirror the hierarchy of a high school cafeteria. So, it gets some points there. No, this one, this one is set up for one reason and one reason only, to smash that patriarchy. So, uh, what is this story about? Well, our, our main character is Tom Holland, who uh, lives on this planet just called New World, 
Um, and on this bizarre planet, due to some of the makeup of the environment, all the men who are on this planet are stricken with what they call the noise. And what this basically means is that they can see and hear your every thought. So it's kind of like mind reading, but not really. But basically, yeah, every thought you have is projected and they can hear it. And sometimes if it's a strong emotion, they can actually see what you're thinking. So the men of this society have learned to either uh, control the noise. Uh, some have been, a, have learned to like psychically project images out so they all could become Professor X, basically. And some have learned to control it to such a point they can keep it quiet. They can, uh, the mayor of the town, played by the villain from Casino Royale, uh, is so good that, you know, nobody knows what he's thinking, which automatically tells you that this guy is evil if his costume, stance, and choice of actor didn't tell you that. Um... Also on this little planet, um, at least in the town of which we are starting out, there are no women. Supposedly, all of the women were killed by the native alien population, the Spackle. Keep, keep that in the back of your mind for a second. Um, uh, and also, I believe I already mentioned this, but... Uh, the noise does not affect women. You, you can't hear what women are thinking. So right away from that setup, I think you probably know what the big shocking twist of this uh, this little story is going to be. If you, if you can't guess it, um, you need to go back and do some work on deductive reasoning. So anyway, the inciting incident of this little tale is that um, a new crop of settlers are heading to the planet, and one of, they send a like a scout ship which has uh, Ray from nowhere, Daisy Ridley, in it, um, which crashes, and she is the lone survivor. So this is the first woman that Tom Holland has ever seen. Um, he is kind of interested to learn about her, whereas all the adults in the village don't like her because um, reasons? The best I could figure out is that they want to use her to contact her ship so that they can ambush the ship and use the ship to get away from the planet because they don't want to be there anymore which I can understand um, but it does beg the question why just kind of send, can you please send a radio message and tell them Hey, can you pick us up? Because we don't want to be here anymore. I mean, you, you could have asked. You didn't necessarily have to resort right away to murder because that's exactly what they plan to do. They want to murder Ray or use Ray or kidnap Ray. I, it's very unclear what exactly they want to do with Daisy Ridley once they capture her, but it, it, somehow it's going to get them off the planet. So it's kind of like space mutiny, only in reverse. Um, so Tom Holland being a nice boy um, rescues Daisy Ridley and they go on or they go on the run to a supposed new town or a second town that Tom Holland had never heard of but apparently has also got people in it so again you probably know where this story is going <laughs> what what is he gonna find when he gets to the new village and along the way they form a relationship and Tom Holland finds that all of the things he's been taught in his life, all of the truths that the elders have bestowed upon him have been big, fat man lies. The, he learns that the, the alien population, or the native population, as Daisy Ridley points it out, um, is, are not, in fact, killers. They're just very ugly CGI creatures, but they are not uh, killers. And... Should I spoil it? I'm going to spoil it. What the hell? Let's spoil it for you. Uh, when they do find the second town, it turns out, oh, guess what? There are women after all. 
and they live in this town. It's not like an all-woman town, which is what I thought it was going to be, so I give the film credit for that. You know, it's just another community where the men aren't all psychotic murderers. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. You can tell by the very dismissive way I'm explaining this plot that this film just doesn't work for me. And there's two major reasons why. The first one is it is boring and dull as hell. It meanders from one plot point to another and nothing is really treated with any kind of gravity. Nothing is ever framed or uh, presented in a way like it matters. The, the discovery of the second town where women are you know, still alive, because again, to Tom Holland, there's no, there haven't been any women on this, you know, on this planet at all. There's no other towns on this planet, as far as he knows. Um, this should be a huge reveal, and it's not. It's like, oh, okay, here we are. Oh, oh women. Okay, cool, great. Let's uh, let's let's go to the next scene. Uh, you know, um, this is also a plot point that you think would have come closer towards the end of the film. It's like the start of act two, I think. It's like, it's, it's right in the middle. So it doesn't even get kind of a grand, uh, a grand placement in the film. It's just like, oh, okay. Next stop. It just, it's the next stop in the road map. So, so yeah, there, it's, there's no dramatic tension. There is one really good chase scene, right? Uh, when, when Ray and, uh, Peter Parker are, escaping from the town of toxic masculinity. Um, that, that shot really well. It's pretty exciting. Um, but that's pretty much it. The rest of it is just very kind of, and we go here, and we go here, and now we're here. So, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work all of that well. Okay, but let's talk about the real problem I had with this, uh, with this film. And that is that its central metaphor, its general thesis, is so freaking thin that you'd swear somebody smeared chicken grease on the script. It is just the most obvious, you know. So let me boil this down for you without the science fiction. So a young man... So let's just let's just use a, a generalized term and say a millennial. That's a general term, but just to give us a label. A younger man discovers that the town of toxic masculinity, which is exactly what this town is, it's, it's that if men are left to their own devices, will basically become cavemanish, brutish, wild west, you know, assholes whose every thought is I have to kill something. Um. They, they, it turns out the big twist is that they've killed all the women because they didn't like the fact that the women could hear their thoughts and knew what horrible, horrible brutes and monsters they were. Along the way, they have also um, mistreated and misled the native population. Are you getting, are you getting the metaphor here? If it's not clear enough, let me give you this little piece of visual fun. So one of the so there's two main villains. There's the bad guy from Casino Royale, whose name I can never pronounce, and there's a preacher. This, this preacher is clearly insane because he's religious, so therefore he is he is incredibly insane. And you can tell this because not only is he always quoting the Bible in a very crazy way, but his noise noise usually represents something like this blue swirl around the head. Not with this guy. He's got fire all around him at all times. So if you can't tell that this guy is evil and off his nut, well, don't worry. We're going to make sure you know it. Okay, look. Science fiction, when it is at its best, always holds a mirror up to society and lets us see the cracks and wrinkles. That is good science fiction. It is a, it is a time-honored tradition. 
okay? All of the best sci-fi has done this. Whether it's trying to inform us of the beauty of human potential, like something like uh, Star Trek or Gattaca, or it's warning us against our own self-destructive tendencies like Planet of the Apes, or almost the entirety of the Twilight Zone, the idea of using it as social commentary is not in itself a bad thing. But you know what, what immediately kind of undercuts it is when your metaphor is so bloody obvious and so on the nose that it is less of a meditative work and more of a blogger reposting a meme or a tweet chain that they found. This doesn't give us any insight into the situation. It only holds it up and goes, look at me, look at me, look how enlightened I am. And that's the feeling I get from this movie. And it's, you know, it's central conceit is that it is more interested in showing you how enlightened it is and how, you know, it's only new young men who, you know, reject toxic masculinity that can, that can be good. And anybody past the age of 30 is already gone because you're just an evil man, you know? It's not to say that it's not true. Just saying that maybe it's a little on the nose. You think I'm joking with, you know, the town of toxic masculinity. That might as well be what they call it. So, again, this film just feels very much like it's trying to show off how forward-thinking it is instead of holding something up and letting the audience kind of put the pieces together for themselves. And I know what people are going to say, well, it's a young adult novel. Well, you know, folks, maybe... You know, I teach high school, so maybe this is going to sound weird coming from me, but maybe we're not giving teenagers enough credit. Maybe, you know, kids and young adults or teenagers or whoever these books are aimed for, maybe they don't need everything spelled out for them. Maybe they can kind of make the connections on their own. You know, maybe we can trust in their intelligence. You know, maybe we can give them something that can actually grow with them and they can find new nuance in as they get older, as opposed to something which is going to speak to them right at this moment in their life, but is never going to do so again because they're going to grow out of it. You know, just, just an idea, just a thought. And I understand that that is way easier said than done. So please don't misunderstand. I get that that's not easy to do. Also, okay, so those are my big complaints. But I gotta also say on this, can we just talk about the very uncreative names and terms in this movie? I mean, the best thing you could think of for all this is the noise. And the best name you could think of for your were the spackle. The spackle. Seriously. The painting technique. That's what we're naming our aliens after here. Honestly, it would have been better if they were just, you know, called the natives or something. And hell, it would have, this film loves being on the nose with its, with its metaphors. That would have played right into it. I mean, it'd be better if they didn't have a name. You know, they're just like the others or whatever. It's, it's you know, more mysterious. But the frick, the, I can't take it seriously. Or like, uh, the spackle murdered my mommy. I, I can't. I can't, Tom Holland. I really can't. <laughs> it just, it doesn't work for me, buddy. Sorry. Um, and yeah, and the whole thing is just very anticlimactic. I don't know. Obviously, this is a, a YA series because they're all series, you know. So there's, I think I was doing a little bit of research. I think there's like three or four books in the series. I don't know. So I don't know if this one was trying for, um, you know, the first step in a proposed series, which again, I believe that's the case because they all want their own Harry Potter, Twilight, Hunger Games. You know, any multi-film franchise that's going to guarantee you box office. Um, 
So maybe that's why it ends on such an anticlimactic kind of note. But again, the whole film is anticlimactic, so I don't know if it's just because they want to load the bases for a proposed sequel, or if it's just because it's kind of dull and doesn't go anywhere. Um, yeah, so I, I fully admit that I am the wrong person for this thematically. Thematically, not thematically. I don't know why I said that. Um, I fully get that. So, you know, if you are kind of in the wheelhouse for this this type of thing, if this is one of the things you really love, then you may enjoy this one. If you're one of the fans of things like Divergent or The Maze Runner or whatever, then this is probably gonna be right up your alley. Um, me, sorry, it's just, it's, it's just too, too blah. So let's do this. Let's go final grade for uh, Chaos Walking, which going along with everything else, is that just the most generic title you've ever heard? It's not mysterious. It's not interesting. It's not unique to the, to the, to the world as far as I know. Why? Well, at least the books, when I was looking them up, they had some bizarre, interesting names. Why not go with that? Anyway, off, off topic. So, final grade for this little cinematic opus. Uh, I'm going a C minus. I'm going a C minus. So, why a C minus as opposed to because I've done nothing but rail on the picture? Um, well, I because I'm going to give it a couple of bonus points. So, first of all, like I said, um, the overarching metaphor is something different than you know, the social standings of a high school cafeteria, which a lot of these movies are. So I give it credit for trying to do something a little different. While I don't like the way it presents its message, I do applaud that it's taking, it's looking at a broader social issue other than just, you know, popularity is hard and being a teenager is hard. So I appreciate that. I also appreciate, and I don't know if this is, this is just because it's a PG-13 film, um, I also appreciate that, you know, mind the mind reading thing, um, I was waiting for it to happen and it didn't. You know, you have a, you drop a woman into a town uh, of toxic masculinity. Um, I was waiting for her, which of these guys is going to think about nothing but raping her. You, you were just waiting for it, you know, going, ooh, woman. Ah. Um, they don't do that. They go more the route with Tom Holland. Uh, if, you, if you remember that episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which, uh, speaking of which, date night podcast, listen to me and my girlfriend talk about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, huh? Anywho, um, if you remember that episode of Buffy where she gets the ability to read minds and all Xander can think of is sex, that's basically what they do with uh, Daisy Ripley and Tom uh, Tom Holland, is that he's he's constantly trying to push back thoughts about how pretty she is and how he wants to kiss her and all that. So it's played more for an awkward, um, awkward beats between them as opposed to, I was just waiting for one of those animal guys in the town of toxic masculinity to just like be like, ah, oh, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna do horrible things to her. And they didn't do that. So they get, they get some points. Also, I think the main thing that pushes this up out of the failing area is that you have a good cast. Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley are both really good actors. And when the film actually lets them interact, which is not a lot, um, it, it's pretty good. They have a nice chemistry. I like them. I wish I could see them in a real movie. Um, but the noise that he's constantly going gets very distracting, which is supposed to be the point. I get that. But it's just, it doesn't really work for me. But I give credit to the fact it has some good actors in it who are doing some good, good-ish performances, as good as they can do with the, uh, with the material that they're given. So, you know, I'm willing to bend and not fail it, but I, I, I can't imagine watching this again, and I can't imagine thinking of it again once I hit the off button on this, uh, on this review. So there you have it. Another YA franchise falls flat on its face. So uh, there you have it. That's all for me. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Take it easy. Be safe. And as always, drive safe. And I will see you at the movies.